Okay, so um, there's other people who have done some pretty good retrospectives, so I'm not gonna cover the same ground that happened before. We're gonna kind of meander a little bit off the path. Um, there's a really excellent book that was published, I think in 2014, if I remember correctly, um, by Paul Hightower and Brian Brown. Um, and they did a really great job, and I actually used this um, to sort of get up to speed on what had already been covered. And so, um, unfortunately, genealogy, this, the only copy of this book in the Fort Worth Public Library System is in the Genealogy Local History and Archives Unit. So um, if you want to check out a copy, feel free to ask the library to order a copy, and I'm sure it won't be a problem. Um, the other person that I have to thank for, uh, for basically, as Linda said, getting me up to speed on the history of Fort Worth is Mike Nichols. Uh, he has a blog he posts every single day. It's basically like the newspaper of the past. Um, and he, Mike Nichols himself mentions that uh, he didn't start really learning about Fort Worth history. Um, until he retired and he really started going around and asking questions about um, Fort Worth and the world that he was seeing. So um, I just want to take the opportunity here to mention that anybody can do history. You don't have to have a PhD. There's a lot of stories out there that haven't been told. And anybody who's interested in finding those stories, I definitely want to encourage them to I mean, you don't have to write a book, you don't have to write a blog, but um, to really think about either writing your own story or writing other people's stories that you find. And um, if you ever need help doing research or finding resources, definitely here at the Fort Worth Public Library, the Genealogy Local History and Archives Unit, I mean, that's our job is to assist researchers. And they, don't, they can be avocational. You can just walk in the door and have an idea and um, we will help you with that. So, um, and this thing's slow. Okay, hold on. I can see we're gonna have a, there we go. Okay, so, um, okay, I said it wasn't gonna be a retrospective, but we gotta start somewhere. So beer is old. Um, it's not a new invention. It's not an American invention. Um, it's not even a European invention. Um, so, this is a Sumerian um, cylinder seal that's um, on the left-hand side here. And um, you notice, I, so beer wasn't always, it, we imagine it as this like, you know, liquid thing. It was more like a gruel in the past, but it was a fermented drink. And so the reason for the straws in both the Egyptian um, scene of the gentleman sipping out of the amphora and um, this couple that on the left that are um, drinking out of um, another vessel with straws. Um, it's because they're trying to keep the, the main part, the gruel in the bottom of the vessel and they're drinking the liquid that's coming up. Um, Egyptians also use beer as a form of currency. Um, so that kind of tells you how valuable it was. And I always joke that um, beer and bread built the pyramids. Um, and I, so um, beer does arrive in the New World. In fact, the pilgrims of the Mayflower, the story is that um, they chose to drop anchor and um, make their home on the coast of New England rather than any point further south that might have been more comfortable um, because they, um, they actually were running out of beer. I mean, the ship wasn't running out of beer because the sailors had their own um, supply of beer that they needed to make it back to um, England, but the settlers were running out of beer and they were like, well, you know what, we better get off the ship and because um, otherwise we're gonna run out of things to drink. Um, so, um, and beer was, a common household, I mean, it was something that wasn't always industrially made there. Um, it's very common for people to make beer at home. Um, so, And so why drink beer? Um, many people believe that the reason um, people drank fermented liquids, um, particularly beer, is because 
Um, they knew that the water potentially was unsafe to drink. That is actually, um, that's not a true fact. Uh, the idea of germ theory wasn't really, um, there wasn't a belief in germ theory. Most people believed that the reason they got sick was because of miasmas, and which essentially translates as bad air. Um, they did not connect the dots. And in fact, so John Snow, who you see here on the left-hand side, um, he was a physician. Um, he was trying to figure out in 1854 in Soho, London, there was um, a really terrible cholera epidemic and um, many people were dying. And he actually wasn't, he, he mapped all of the patients and the deaths as a result of cholera in an attempt to figure out the source of the cholera. And he determined it was the Broad Street um, um, public well. Um, and he presented that fact and he basically his own colleagues, other physicians just sort of laughed him out of the room. Um, he actually ended up having to appeal to Queen Victoria and then um, the pump was closed down. The handle actually was taken off of the pump to prevent people from um, drinking the water. Uh, one of the reasons he figured out that uh, it was the pump was because he noticed that the workers at a local brewery in the area, they were the only ones who never got sick because they were drinking the beer. Um, so um, Louis Pasteur, it's, um, he doesn't actually develop the germ theory and it you know, publishes and gets it accepted until 1861. And so just as an, another little fun aside, Louis Pasteur is also the man who figured out the mechanism for fermentation. So I thought it was kind of an interesting little connection. Not only does he develop the idea of germ theory, but he figures out um, how fermentation, the mechanism of how it's working. So um, by 1866, you can see in the center here, there's, um, you started seeing um, lithographs um, sort of equating um, potentially public drinking water could be dangerous. Um, so at that point, people sort of really connect the dots. But as we know, beer is very, very old as an idea. So people were not um, drinking beer because um, they thought um, the water was dangerous. Um, so early Fort Worth. Uh, now we finally get to Fort Worth. So for nearly 40 years, there were multiple attempts to um, establish a commercial brewing industry in the city. Um, much like the pilgrims, the New England pilgrims who arrive um, in the New World in the late 16th, early 17th century, um, they arrive in a land that's basically untrammeled by industry and only occupied by um, Native Americans. So basically creature comforts and any bare necessities of life, you had to bring them with you. And so if you lost your hammer in the woods, well, you might not get another hammer for a very long time. Um, so early settlers did select locations where there was um, freshwater springs. So people did um, drink fresh water. Um, and uh, so, um, when Ripley Arnold first arrives here with his um, group looking for a place to establish Camp Worth, um, he did stop at a spring. And actually, Mike Nichols um, had a really great uh, presentation on the history of how he was like looking for the different locations of springs. Um, so um, I looked through early recollections of people here in Fort Worth and their memories of you know, what they drank. Um, it turns out that whiskey was actually the first social lubricator and political facilitator in these parts, um, probably because um, whiskey just lasts a lot longer. Um, and basically, it's more potent. Um, so um, Captain Terrell, he was an early settler, came here in the mid 1850s. Um, he waxes on and on about whiskey. Um, these are just two of the quotes from his recollection. I love that um, they used corn stoppers, not even cork. Um, so, and also uh, Howard Peak. he was the second child that was born here in Fort Worth in the um, early 1850s. And um, so he recollected how Fort Worth became the county seat and not 
uh, Birdville. It was a result of whiskey being used to attract people to come to Fort Worth. And um, well, in fact, the whiskey was stolen from Birdville and um, they were going to use it to attract voters. And instead, uh, Fort Worth ended up with the county seat as a result of having a barrel of whiskey. Um, so people did homebrew beer. Um, and yes, I realize that's a spelling mistake, but I took it directly from the newspaper article. And I'm sorry that it's a little light on the one side. Um, the reason is because this is a scan of a newspaper that was um, bound into a book using um, Japanese paper, and so that's the paper um, binding that you see there on the one side. Um, but, and I realize this is coming from Dallas, but ultimately Fort Worth and Dallas, um, despite the fact that people like Eamon Carter had an intense dislike of Dallas, um, there is a strong connection um, between Dallas and Fort Worth, particularly um, in all facts of life, but also in um, brewing, so um, especially in this case, so um, yes, people made beer at home in this case. It happened to be made with sweet potatoes. And you'll notice it says there, uh, a delicious and harmless beverage. That was the opinion of beer. Um, it was essentially people not only drank it for, um, because they might've been thirsty, but it was also viewed as a kind of sustenance. Like, you know, that old joke about, you know, I'm gonna have a barley sandwich. Um, that was sort of the opinion of beer um, that it provided uh, nutrition. All right, so the first attempt at, uh, at a brewery, a commercial brewery, um, and I call it a wannabe as it wanted to be. Um, so uh, Nathaniel Terry, he's a, um, he was a lieutenant governor from Alabama. He arrives here um, in the early 1850s. And um, see the red arrow um, on the map? That is where um, Nathaniel Terry had his plantation. He had, um, he was, he came here because he was somewhat financially embarrassed from his time in Alabama, so he took whatever he had left and um, arrived here in Fort Worth. Um, then he establishes a brewery. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Civil War intervenes and his working crew, AKA his um, population of enslaved individuals who are doing the construction, um, they, um, you know, they were emancipated after the Civil War, so uh, he no longer had a, um, a working crew. And not only that, but Nathaniel Terry was even more financially embarrassed after the Civil War. He made the unfortunate uh, decision to sell property and get paid in Confederate dollars rather than gold. So he had no money at all, and he basically died broke. Um, so. Um, so in um, the 1930s, late 1930s, the uh, Federal Writers Project, they came through and interviewed people and asked them to recollect their um, youth. And so this, on the left, you'll see there's uh, um, James Terry, who's not a relation. I actually looked this up. He's not a relation of Nathaniel Terry. He was actually born in White Settlement. Um, he recollects the, that the brewery, the foundation still existed. Um, he claimed that the location was where the blue arrow is on the map. Um, and, but, you know, Nathaniel Terry had his property a little farther to the north, so it's unclear, but um, there definitely somewhere in that area there was um, the beginnings or an attempt to start a brewery, but it never got off the ground. Um, so what I thought was really interesting was the area where um, the brewery was constructed, actually became a local swimming hole for all the young boys um, in the area. And so James Terry, um, he's 81 in the late 1930s, he um, recollects going there and, and swimming and um, it still existed in um, the location in the late 19th century. And so Charles, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, Lowey, um, or Lau, he, uh, he recollects as a young boy going and swimming, but by the um, late 19th century, he says, um, 
is it? Um, and just what it had to do with a brewery was not explained to us. So by that point, people weren't even remembering that um, a brewery um, had been attempted. And, and by now, it's probably because the river has been altered. Um, that area is probably underwater or completely gone. Um, so uh, 1869, um, that quote there, dead, dreary, desolation, and empty, that is when Cam Van Zandt uh, arrives here in Fort Worth. Um, I don't know the exact date of that photo on the right, but every time I see that photo, I think of um, Van Zandt's um, recollection, because there's practically nobody. They're just like way off in the distance. Um, so Simon Meyer, he had a very successful beer garden in um, Dallas. He claimed that he started a brewery in 1869, but if Van Zandt's recollection of Fort Worth was that it was dead and dreary, um, it's no wonder that Simon Meyer goes back to Dallas um, to um, start his um, beer garden. And so uh, there were apparently, I found in the newspaper, two other articles that um, referenced very early breweries. Uh, and I. Throughout my research, I noticed that um, probably because of the amount of supplies needed that um, railroads and breweries are um, very sort of interlinked. And so um, here in 1873, uh, uh, Maurer and company, you can see on the left, they, um, they apparently had a brewery in operation. And then there was in December, um, of eight, later on of the same year, um, apparently there was another brewery um, very nearby. Both of them were apparently um, near the train station. And so you'll see, um, yeah, this thing is, there we go. Um, so under the red arrow, that's like the little smoke there coming out of the train. And so the um, right close to where the train station was, that's where the breweries were located. And, so just to orient you, this is the courthouse here at the very bottom, close to the river. And so um, if you wanted some fresh made beer, you had to take a bit of a jaunt. And, but um, I imagine that these breweries potentially might not have lasted, um, probably because in 1873, there was a financial crisis in the US. And so again, Fort Worth is struggling to cling on. Um, the other reason that Fort Worth is struggling to cling on is that in 1873, the city of Fort Worth had planned and knew that the, um, the railroad was going to come, but um, because of the financial crisis, that railroad was actually halted quite a few miles from Fort Worth. And so again, Fort Worth is in danger of um, just sort of rolling up the streets and blowing off into the prairie. Um, but they hold it together. Um, and so in 1884, um, by 1876, the railroad arrives and supplies are coming in. And so Fort Worth really, I mean, it's boom time. Um, and Fort Worth, people of Fort Worth, they knew that's what the railroad was going to bring. Um, it was also a junction for points farther to the north, like up towards Denton. And so, um, some individuals had plans to, near the railroad station, they were going to build a, um, ice factories and breweries. Um, they did not end up building that. And so it was not until May of 1891 that the first proper solid, um, industrial brewing company arrived. Um, it was hugely successful. Um, the story of the operation of the brewery under careful guidance of Zane Seti uh, for more than a quarter century, that's very well known and well documented. But um, the thing I wanted to cover um, in the story here is the really charismatic and kind of enigmatic founder of the Texas Brewing Company. Um, he's I think part of the reason he's not well known is because he um, only spent three years here in Fort Worth and he left behind this incredible legacy, but he's hardly known at all and I had to do a fair bit of digging on him. Um, and 
he just totally changed the landscape of industrial brewing um, and the availability of um, home, like basically industrially home brewed beer. Um, so James J. Gannon is the man who essentially established the brewery here, um, the first really industrial brewery here in Fort Worth. Um, we don't have a photo of him. Um, he, he lived during a time of incredible population growth for not just Fort Worth, but also the US. Um, there was a lot of immigration from all over Europe, um, the rise of cities, and then also industrial development, not just of breweries, but just any kind of industrial development. So in short, James Gannon, he's a man who's like the embodiment of his time, but then we hardly know him at all. Um, so he's an Irish immigrant, and um, he arrives in um, 1853 with his family. And so um, you'll see uh, up on the left there, uh, Patrick Gannon is the father, and Elizabeth is the mother. And then way down here, this family's huge, which is kind of like almost the classic Irish family. It's an enormous family. Um, they're really. Um, I think there were nine of them that immigrated, and two more show up in Iowa, so um, they weren't lacking. Um, so Patrick Gannon, he's, he's in his 50s when he immigrates, so um, I think it must have been some serious financial pressure to force a man in his 50s, and with all those kids, to essentially take a risk. Um, so when they end up in Iowa, they've only been here for three years, they're enormously productive, maybe because they have a lot of hands, they also have a lot of mouths to feed. Um, so um, then they, you'll notice something I want to point out, you'll notice how close, so they live in um, Muscatine County, Iowa, you'll notice it's actually relatively close to Chicago because that is where they move after a few years. And family moves to Chicago by 1860, um, they relocate. Um, they've also increased, they have more children, and um, I'm sure they felt right at home. Uh, Chicago was the fourth largest Irish dominant city in the US. It was the fastest growing city in the world between 1830 and 1860. Um, so, like I said, this is like emblematic of, you know, the incredible growth in the US, the arrival of immigrants, and um, just the industrial, uh, the amount of industrial activity that's happening. I mean, here's, you know, these immigrant family, they end up, um, they go to Chicago. Um, so here's the federal census, and I thought it was kind of ironic. Um, so they're an Irish family, and they move to a city that's like, you know, 20% Irish, and, and let's not forget, this is also the city that dyes the entire river green, so they're still very, very connected to their Irish heritage. And so they actually don't end up living in an Irish neighborhood. All of their neighbors are German. Um, so, and I even trimmed off the bottom of the uh, census record. There are just more and more Germans, every single one of their neighborhoods, neighbors. And <clears throat> so they, um, they actually live in Chicago for a fair amount of time, um, more than a decade. The family is very <clears throat> excuse me, they're very successful. Um, the blue dot on the map, that is uh, where they lived. And um, so they live just half a block from where Van Buren meets the south branch of the Chicago River. Um, they begin a furniture business, James Gannon. And um, so this is them in the city directory. Uh, this is the business they started. Um, it's also on Van Buren, just a little farther away, a few blocks. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, and then they lived, you'll see, um, not every Gannon, it turns out Gannon is a really popular Irish name, which I was unaware of, but um, so all of the ones that are living at 398 West Van Buren, um, those are um, the Gannon family there. And so the only people listed in the city directory are the ones actually working. Um, so you can't see the mom or the, the daughters. Um, so the map that's on the left-hand side, you'll notice uh, there's sort of an orangey-reddish colored area. 
That is the extent of the fire, the great Chicago fire of 1871. So the O'Leary's cow supposedly kicks down the um, kicks down a lantern and burns down like four miles of the city. So um, yes, the Gannons lived within the area. So they survive. The, they actually still end up living in the same location. So, um, so they kind of got burned out, but they still stay at the same place. Um, and in case you're wondering where the fire starts, it actually starts just sort of to the south. Um, so the fire went starts in the lower left and then burns up to the upper right. Um, and so they survived the fire of um, 1871. They also survived the financial panic of 1873. You know, the panic didn't just affect Fort Worth. Um, it affects, um, you know, all of the U.S. And so they weather that. And um, the James um, and his brother Edward, they're working at Field and Lighter, which is a premier, like, it's sort of like the Nordstrom of Chicago. Um, later, if you know anything about Chicago, it becomes Marshall Field and Company. Um, so, but by 1874, um, so they're working at Field and Lighter, but something makes them leave Chicago. They somehow decide, and I don't know what it is, but um, they leave in the middle of 1874, and they decide to, and not the whole family, it is John, James, and Edward, just three brothers out of that whole family of like 12 or 13 kids. Um, they decide, the rest of the family stays behind, um, and they leave the furniture business with one of the brothers. And so they arrive in North Texas. Um, we don't know exactly how they made their way to Texas, but it's basically a straight shot um, down from Chicago to New Orleans. They would have taken the shipping routes along the Illinois and Michigan Canal, um, then down the Illinois River and then the Mississippi. And then like many other immigrants, once they arrive in New Orleans, they would have traveled along the coast. Arrived in Houston um, by 1872, Houston had train service up to Dallas. I have no doubt that they took the train. and. I have no evidence, but I'm pretty sure you were smart, and they weren't stupid guys. Um, so thanks to a biography completed um, by brother John, who ends up becoming um, a bank, big bank executive, uh, we know that they arrive um, uh, by September of um, 1874. But you'll notice in the city directory on the left-hand side, so that is the Dallas city directory of 1878. You'll see Edward is a bookkeeper here at the city bank, and then there's John. Um, he is also working at the bank, but you'll notice that James, our great um, brewing company founder, um, he doesn't appear there, and he's kind of a bit of a wanderer. I actually found him in Denton. He spent a couple of years in Denton. He was buying property around the, um, the center of Denton. I think he had sort of his own individual plan. And this sort of, that's sort of um, typical of him when I see he, when his um, movements are noted in the newspaper when he becomes a famous businessman, he does tend to travel around. Um, so he's a bit of a restless character, but, um, and in fact, he also convinces his brother Edward to go in with him on some of the property up in Denton, but then he gives up the idea, and by 1880, the brothers have formed a bank, a pro actually 1879, sorry, um, they form a bank, and so by 1880, you find that in the city directory, they're listed, um, that's on the upper right, and um, the great thing was that they, um, like the rest of Dallas, they closed down for Mayfest, um, sort of an example of how, um, how much influence the sort of German community had. Everyone was out partying and even all the banks, it was basically a bank holiday for them. Um, so down at the bottom, you'll see the Gannon Brothers Bank, um, they're closed for Mayfest. So, um, so they work at the bank for a while, um, but then James gets this idea, and I'm assuming it's James. Um, so this is 1886. They, the brothers end up buying um, a brewery. Um, it's owned by Anton uh, Wagenhäuser. He gets into financial difficulty. He's the one who established the brewery. 
um, and it was named after him, but then um, if you have an idea for a business, you make yourself the president, you don't make someone else the president. So I'm pretty sure that it's James's idea because he is the president of this Dallas Brewery that was organized. Um, and you'll notice his brother, John, um, who actually took business, went to business school in Chicago. Um, he's listed and you know, eventually becomes a bank executive. Of course, he's the treasurer. But you see this guy in the middle, M. Keeley. Who's this guy? And um, so this is Michael Keeley. He is um, a entrepreneur, a businessman from Chicago. And um, he started off with an ale importer warehouse. He also had a malting house, but then he makes his money, um, makes money off of um, soda, basically bottling soda water. Um, he's enormously wealthy. He's also an Irishman, not surprising. Um, so I think he's the money behind the purchase of the brewery. Um, Keeley did have a brewery, but he did not buy that brewery until after the Gannon brothers left Fort Worth. And um, like the um, Gannon brothers, the, you'll notice, so Keeley's an Irishman, but if you look at this image for his brewery, it's all very iconic German um, imagery, these little like woodland elf guys drinking their beer, and then, you know, it's Bach beer. They're, He's not brewing porters. He's not brewing typical Irish like ales or, uh, you know, it's not Guinness. It's um, German beer is preferred at this point in time. So, um, but how does James Gannon and Michael Keeley, you know, they're not in the same social circles. Um, Keeley is enormously wealthy and Gannon and his family, they were basically lower middle class. Um, so it took a bit of digging. Um, Essentially, um, they met as business people. So that blue dot again, that is where the Gannon family met. But later on, the, um, this is from the 1871 Chicago City Directory. So it's before the brothers leave. Um, you'll notice here at the top, James Gannon, mattress and lounge manufacturer. At, I think it was at 290 South Canal Street. So that's this yellow dot. Um, Guess who has a business right next door? Michael Keeley at 289. So, you know, they obviously chatted. They knew each other. They had adjacent businesses. That is how they got to know each other. And that, I don't know how, whether James Gannon was always in contact or whether he had the idea to write Michael Keeley and ask him um, if he would help fund um, the purchase of the brewery. Um, but that was quite a cup of sugar to borrow. So um, they start brewing right away. Uh, it's pretty successful. And um, so the image in the center that is part of a uh, Sanborn map from the city of Dallas. And you'll notice you can just barely see it um, right underneath where a little, by the number two, it says Dallas Brewing. Um, so that's where the um, that's where the the brewery, brewery was, and um, they start brewing right away. They buy um, the article on the left hand side. They buy privileges, um, basically a license to be the only ones to serve beer at um, the fair at the Dallas Fairgrounds. And my favorite part too is that um, so the. They're listed first because selling the beer at the fair was the most valuable license. And then way at the bottom, it's peanuts because, you know, peanuts are worth peanuts. And so that I got a good laugh out of that. Sorry. It's a bad pun. But anyways, so um, James Gannon, he's running the brewery. And um, there was a, if you want to read up on the Dallas brewery, there was a little bit of a legal, actually more than a legal kerfuffle between Anton um, Bagenhoise and um, the way the brewery was sold to them. And Anton, um, from what I've read, he got into a lot of uh, legal scrapes, so he was a bit of a slippery guy. Um, and, uh, but um, 1890, there's a big flood, the Trinity. It floods Fort Worth. It also happens to flood Dallas, and you'll notice how close the brewery is. 
And so um, the brewery gets flooded out because it's very close to the Trinity. But, so that's April 29th of 1890. But on April 15th of 1890, the Fort Worth Daily Gazette notes that a proposition has been placed before the Chamber of Commerce um, to establish a brewery here in Fort Worth. This doesn't mean that James Gannon knew the flood was going to happen. Um, I think he had plans for expansion. The newspaper actually announced that um, he had come on April 4th with this proposition. Um, but I think he got lucky when he came on April 15th because the Chamber of Commerce was established at that same time. So he, I don't know whether he hears that the Chamber of Commerce is being established, but he is presenting it to other businessmen. And the whole point of a Chamber of Commerce is to promote the establishment of businesses in town. So he basically has the luck of the Irish because in 1886, um, a Swiss man came and he tried to establish a brewery, a uh, Swiss man from Iowa, ironically. Um, he tries to establish a brewery in Fort Worth, and he gets no nibbles at all. No one wants to take him up on it. And then in 1888, Wagenhäuser, um, he comes here, and he's like, yeah, I want to try and establish a brewery. And everyone's like, me? They just shrug their shoulders. So um, when Gannon arrives, he's got, um, he's got some leverage from the um, the Chamber of Commerce. They're giving them a lot of lift. So the Chamber of Commerce decides, so um, I don't know if I, I didn't know in the previous, but um, so James Gannon asks for a $20,000 premium to establish the brewery, not to help build the brewery, but to help promote and advertise it. And I think he wanted to see how serious uh, Fort Worth really was. So the Chamber of Commerce gets together an ad hoc committee, and then they're sent out to go and collect money from people to try and get this premium immediately after the next day. So in the newspaper on April 15th is the notice that a brewery, um, the Chamber of Commerce wants to establish a brewery. The very next day, there is a published letter from a prohibitionist saying, do we need, and I underlined this in red, do we need a drunkard factory? I, I love that. I'm not going to refer to all breweries as drunkard factories. And and then he also says, I regret the coming of, I'm going to assume, it was, I mean, it might be a woman too. Um, so I regret the coming of the brewery on account of the auxiliaries it will bring along with it. Beer gardens, and we're going to cover beer gardens later. Um, and Sunday evening games and disorderly carousals. So, um, yes. And, but, um, James Gannon, he means business. The Chamber of Commerce actually spends four and a half months trying to collect together this 20,000. Um, in the beginning, they got, they got about 6,000 together, but they never quite hit that 20,000. And then um, James Gannon says, okay, give me 10,000 and we're gonna move forward. And so it does move forward. And by 1890, um, they actually have the, they establish the contract to build the brewery and everything goes forward. And you will notice that it says, um, so right under the blue arrow, Mr. Gannon is backed by Chicago Capital. So he's still being supported. I don't know if it's the Keeleys or someone else, and we'll find out in another couple slides who it is. But he's, he's got other money um, working on this because breweries are expensive. I mean, Wagenhäuser, he claimed to have spent 200000 establishing his brewery in Dallas, which um, the Gannons took over. Um, so... Uh, the other thing I thought was interesting was the Chamber of Commerce, as they were trying to collect the money together, they said, um, they said, can Fort Worth allow such a chance to slip by a few years ago if such a proposition were made in Fort Worth? It would have been taken up without a moment's notice. Well, we know that um, Simon Mark and Anton Wagenhäuser both tried to establish breweries and no one took them up on it. So um, that's not... That's totally false. Um, and the other thing they said was basically, um, beer is gonna be drunk here in Fort Worth, whether we make it ourselves or whether it's brought in on a train. So we should really keep the money here. And so that's a totally legitimate statement. Um, so 
There's a story about how um, Gannon establishes the brewery, and the newspaper admits, they say, um, the reason that we have this success is the ability displayed by the president and general manager of the company, Mr. James J. Gannon. He's basically this sort of Svengali that brings the brewery to life. Um, so he says after selling out his brewery in Dallas, he had made up his mind that he would never go into the brewing business again. So this is what he claims in August of 1891. Um, I think it was just to sort of connect people in Fort Worth by saying, you know, we're really lucky, you know, that this guy came here and drank some of the local artesian water and then decided, you know, that's it, I'm going back into brewing because the water is so awesome here. Um, but um, in May of the same year, he actually, he admits that he was looking to expand. So it's, I think he's a guy who's sort of in the, the vein of P.T. Barnum. You know, he can tell a good story and really knows how to sell. Um, so um, I had a look at when they um, created the, they organized the company as a corporation and they established stock. And so a lot of the people you'll see listed at the top there, um, those are all locals, but um, what's really interesting is the ones lower down. So um, we've, got the, we've got a bunch of bankers from Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island. So it turns out that Rhode Island was the most capitalized place practically in the world. Like all of New England was just full rolling in commercial money um, at this time. And so if you really wanted money, it was sort of like um, the Switzerland, I don't know, Switzerland of, of the world. but. Um, they had a ton of um, commercial banks, so if you really needed some serious money, um, that's where they got some of the money. There's also um, brewers from Kansas City, um, from Wisconsin, Walt, George Walter is a brewer from Wisconsin, and unnamed Chicago brewers. It might be the Keeley family, it might be somebody else. So uh, it was basically like a real corp you know, there, it wasn't just local interests. Um, it's really expensive to start a brewery, and so they had um, people from all over. And so they, um, James Gannon was really into public tours. Thousands of people came through the factory before it was started, and he continued tours even after the factory was built. It was the biggest thing in Fort Worth. It dominated the skyline. And um, I don't know if you can see this, but if you take a careful look at the, uh, um, here in the upper right, this little yellow building, it is the Brewery Hotel. So some other savvy businessman decided to name his hotel the Brewery Hotel because if, it's, if you build your building next to the biggest thing in town that happens to be a brewery, of course you're going to name your building the Brewery Hotel. Um, so immediately after they opened, they had plans to expand. They were wildly successful. Um, and so uh, you need supplies. Uh, so before the, a year before the um, brewery even opened, uh, there were articles in the newspaper about how farmers should start planting barley. And uh, none of these articles, particularly this letter on the right-hand side, it's an anonymous letter, but all of the other letters that were um, from farmers, they all had names attached. I kind of don't wonder whether James Gannon wasn't the one who put that in the paper, trying to make sure that they had sufficient supplies for uh, the brewery. And, but basically it's like the letter talks about how, you know, where should we source this, uh, you know, this barley so that, you know, we can always be in, in business. And um, so yeah, they were successful. They already, um, that same year, they started expanding. They bought wagons to, and they even bought refrigerated rail cars. They weren't the only ones buying refrigerated rail cars. They were um, every other brewing company um, that wanted to expand past their local town um, bought rail cars. So um, I don't know if they were using Tiffany rail cars, but I just um, grabbed a picture of that. And, um, but they were definitely running them on the Katy. And uh, so they made sure any time they expanded or did anything different, they were using that to promote um, what a great um, business they were in town and to make sure that people knew they were in town um, and preferred them. And um, when that wasn't enough, uh, James Gannon posted 
And because I didn't find anything about anyone else having a beer war, but I think he just created this article and called it the beer war. Um, I think he started the war. He's basically telling everyone in town that um, our local brew is the quality brew with quality local ingredients. And everyone else that's delivering like Lemp's beer, that was the other, Lemp's and Anheuser, those were um, the two other um, imported brews that were coming into town. And he basically said, if you drink that, you're drinking watered chemicals. And, you know, again, it's not healthy beer, so you really ought to drink our stuff because it's the better thing. And so he starts a uh, war with people who probably didn't even want a war. Um, so um, the, the brewery tours continue um, in kind of an extreme manner. Um, in 1893, there's uh, um, there's a convention that comes into town, the Texas Cattle Raisers, and he invites them to come to the brewery and they're, they're free to take anything in the brewery except the machinery. And so they take ice and they take the beer and they just, like, they just wipe out the whole brewery. I mean, it's really kind of crazy. And, um, and then like a couple months later, um, James Gannon goes up to Chicago and I'm like, is this like the mob where you're like, oh, you better come up to Chicago and explain yourselves. Um, but yeah, he goes up um, to Chicago and maybe he went there to visit family. I don't know. Um, but so he's still with the company in May of 1893. But my November of 1893, he's selling his stock in Dallas. So he is no longer the president of the company. And I'm like, did they kick him out? Because he went kind of berserk and gave away everything inside the, um, the factory. Um, I have no idea, but he is selling all of his capital stock. And uh, the Fort Worth Gazette, um, in the following year, they, um, they note that he has now moved to Dallas, but they say, you know, you will always have a warm spot in our heart for bringing us this delicious beer and for you know, creating this amazing business. Um, we all know how that goes, because you know, hardly anyone knows who James Gannon is now. But um, he goes into politics. Um, he actually becomes the chairman of the Republican Executive Committee. Um, so it's, it's kind of a weird segue. But then um, he disappears from Dallas and he appears back in Chicago and he's basically couch surfing at this point. He is living with his brother who is a salesman and he is, James Gannon himself is now a traveling salesman. They're living in this sort of middle class immigrant neighborhood and um, mainly a bunch of Germans and Irish and um, so he's in Chicago in 1900 as a traveling salesman, living with you know, his nieces and nephews and his older brother. Um, but he ends up in Seattle, and apparently he had been living off and on in Seattle um, shortly after 1900. And I think the title of the article on the left-hand side, Once Wealthy Man Found Dead, um, he died under such unusual circumstances, people actually thought that um, he had been murdered in the street. Um, so he, he goes from this incredible high where he starts this business and he's, you know, he leaves the business. Granted, he, you know, he spent more than six years um, in the brewing business, but only three years in, um, in Fort Worth and he just up and leaves. And then just a, less than a decade later, um, he's found dead in Seattle and he's just a traveling salesman. And it's just the oddest story. And I, like, I think he, he was very creative and then somehow he just had this idea he was going to start another business and it didn't come to pass. And so, um, and what I think is really sad, so the Dallas Morning News notes um, his death, mainly because he's related to 
um, his two brothers, John and Edward, who do become very, who remain successful businessmen, um, both in the banking industry. Um, so he's kind of, it's sort of like an add-on. It's not even like, hey, this guy started this brewery and you know, now he's dead. And oh, by the way, he's got these other brothers in Dallas. It's more like, oh, there's these famous brothers in Dallas um, who are big businessmen and their brother died in Seattle. And um, so James gets brought back to um, Chicago and he's buried in Evanston, just north. And what makes it even more galling is that um, when Zane Seti takes over and when he dies in 1922, his obituary basically suggests that it's Zane Seti that started the Texas Brewing Company. And because it says, well, he was president of the institution and he was one of the founders. And I'm like, well, yeah, kind of, but he wasn't the founder. And so, and it wasn't 1895. They um, totally whiffed it on that one. But um, so I just thought, you know, it becomes Zane Seti, um, granted he spends like a quarter century sort of navigating um, the brewery through the shoals of business, but um, it's Zane Seti that gets ultimately known. and. James Gannon sort of gets shuffled off into obscurity. Um, you'll notice if you look carefully on top of the desk that Zane Seti is sitting from in front of, there's a little tiny beer stein. So it just tells you how um, incredibly connected Zane Seti was to the brewery. Even though Zane Seti was an engineer, he came here with the railroad. Um, he didn't come here to be a, um, a brewery owner. Um, <clears throat> so, the German influence around here, um, and as I said before, um, German beer became wildly popular in the U.S. Um, in the latter half of the 19th century, particularly in the last quarter. So, um, a lot of Germans emigrated to Texas, and um, so they had a huge influence on how, and again, this is immigrants. A huge number of immigrants, um, German immigrants, come um, between 1850, 1875. Um, a lot of them come through um, New Orleans and um, New Orleans, and then Houston and farther north, which is why um, there's like a lot in the southern part of Texas. There's a lot of Germans, um, but they managed to make it up here to North Texas, and so. Um, I don't know if these people are German, but this is sort of what I imagine the typical congenial German um, afternoon, uh, men and women hanging around. Um, you'll notice all the bottles at the feet of the gentlemen and the glasses that are on the table. But also, if you look carefully um, along the back wall in the corner uh, between the gentlemen, there's a row of glasses there too. I think the women were also having um, glasses, and there are way too many bottles for this to be whiskey, um, so it's no doubt um, beer. And based on what the women are wearing, um, it's probably the 1880s. Um, so um, it's always interesting to note how various immigrants come to be associated with different occupations. Um, I think part of the reason for that is one person arrives, settles into a business, and then you know, after that, other immigrants of the same, from the same country they arrive, you take them in, um, help them out because they're new immigrants and, you know, you don't want them to struggle. And then that person goes off. So um, in the case of Germans in Texas, they pretty much lock down the liquor, beer, cigar, and by default, the saloon trade. Um, and they actually had a union. Um, it was not in Fort Worth. Um, it was farther south, but... Um, they were throughout Texas. Um, that was sort of what Germans were known for. Um, and we'll find out actually it was not just um, throughout Texas. But in Fort Worth, the Tivoli was the most famous uh, drinking hall. Um, it was, um, again, managed by a German, um, actually several Germans over time. Um, and as was common in these uh, saloons and drinking halls, there uh, free lunch. And what I thought was really amazing is, I think, do they mention here that they... Um, so if you uh, get a glass of beer for a dime, then um, you get 
a free lunch. And there was another um, clipping, which I did not, I think, is it here? Oh, yeah. Um, free lunch every day at 10 o'clock. Um, wow, people must have gotten up super early to be having lunch at 10 o'clock. Um, so, um, so yeah, we actually have a picture of, we don't have a lot of pictures of early Fort Worth. Um, there, not many exist, but that in the picture on the right, that is the Tivoli Hall on the far right of the image. Um, so, and so all these people are gathered out in front of the street. Everything else, um, well, a few other of the buildings are labeled, but um, probably not the Tivoli because they actually have a sign. And I, just for fun, I zoomed in and colorized the image. So you can see there um, on the post there, it says Tivoli Hall, um, that carriage. Um, those are undoubtedly uh, beer casks. And if you look really carefully, you'll see sort of near the center, um, he's the only one holding a glass of beer, but there's a gentleman holding a glass of beer. There are no women in this picture because it was a saloon. Um, it was not a beer garden, so um, no proper woman, not even a German woman probably would have gone to a saloon. Um, and uh, so there were beer gardens in Fort Worth. Um, the first one was kind of started by Peter Grunewald. Um, actually, Mike Nichols covers a lot of um, Grunewald's um, pavilion and talks about um, Peter Grunewald. He had in town, he had a hotel with um, sort of a saloonish thing. You can see beer, liquors, and cigars. You know, he's a German, so actually, I think he was Swiss, but um, Germanic. Um, so he had. He had a business, you'll notice um, this train right in front of um, his business because it went up the street and went to um, this pavilion. Um, the pavilion was built by the Rosedale Streetcar Company um, to uh, basically in a park as an entertainment to get people to go and take the streetcar line. Um, and essentially, it was the first beer garden in town. You could rent it out. Um, it also, it had, um, it operated like a rental hall, catering service, including beer. Um, so you notice the two little sort of cupolas on the top here. Um, and based on the car, this is not an early image of this. Um, but anyways, um, Grunewald, he buys the pavilion. He um, takes it over in 1889. It was built, I think, in 1885. Um, so if you want to know exactly where it was, um, here's a little detail from a map um, from 1886. And so in the far left of this map, this is the Pioneer Cemetery, Pioneer's Rest. So this is Samuels Ave, and these are little train tracks going up. And right in front of, you'll notice this is the pavilion. So under the blue arrow is the pavilion. Um, and then under that yellow arrow is a um, little streetcar, and actually there's another little streetcar. If you look super, you can barely see it, but um, it looks like a smudge. There's another streetcar right in front of the pavilion. Um, so um, it was used for all kinds of events um, from 1885 to 1905. Um, parties, picnics, fundraisers, reunions, most importantly the Mayfest, um, the Como Social Club, a Germanic social club founded in 1888, they used it for their Mayfest events. Um, it wasn't just beer drinking, they were like Baptist ladies and um, soldier reunions, like Confederate soldier reunions. Um, when the pavilion opened and posted notices in the newspaper, they underscored several times that there would be no shenanigans from any hooligans. Um, this was pretty serious for them. Um, they wanted to make sure that people knew that it was a good place to go. It was not a saloon, um, so you could bring the wife. Um, so the concern and suspicion that some members of the public had for apparent, the apparent loose ways in facilities where beer drinking and entertainments were to be found um, that was really like, it was hard for the German community to shake that off, I think because they started off with saloons, so then when they started establishing beer gardens, um, there was always this suspicion. And yes, I know this is in German, and not only that, it's in the old script. Um, so in 1881, the Freie Presse für Texas out of San Antonio published an exceedingly long editorial 
calling out Senator James Beck, um, United States Senator from Kentucky. He besmirched the tradition of beer gardens. And these are just little tiny clippings of the article. It was super long. There were probably a thousand words in this article. Um, senator Beck claimed he did not want to accuse another senator of corruption in the Senate chamber because he didn't want to turn it into a beer garden, basically insinuating beer gardens were centers of vice and corruption. Um, so, um, and so the German community, take, they took some serious affront to this and um, they said, well, um, beer gardens are civilizing centers. It's a place where um, a man can take his wife and kids and listen to music and drink some mild, mildly stimulating beverage as opposed to this American institution called the bar room where rough men drink whiskey and get drunk. You know, this is like, you know, basically saying, you know, this is the happy family that come to the beer garden and um, also underscoring that, you know, they wanted to, um, in the middle section on the bottom there where they say, um, enjoy genießen neben einem glasse schaumenden Bieres auch die frische Himmelsluft. So um, enjoy a glass of foamy beer under the um, fresh air. So this was, you know, this was an important cultural thing for Germans. And so, um, and so for this reason, one of the other um, questions that the editorial writer has for um, Senator Beck is, you know, are you a bigoted nativist? I mean, do you hate Germans and everything from Germany? Is this why you're saying this? And then he really puts the nail in the coffin. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of insults in this, but um, he says, well, you know, I have never seen any corruption or vice at a beer garden, but the place I have seen corruption and vice is the Senate chamber. So perhaps if Senator Beck wants to um, visit beer gardens and see what a proper place is, as opposed to the bar room of the Senate, then you know he's free to come and try his hand and have some beer. Um, so yeah, Germans didn't, um, didn't take it lightly. Um, so Sons of Herman and Herman Park, this was another beer garden that was in Fort Worth. Um, and this is actually also covered, um, actually quite a bit, Mike Nichols, of course, but um, I just wanted to, this is from the Federal Writers Project, the um, little note on the left. This is one of the, um, so the Sons of Herman Lodge, um, it was a benevolent society. It was actually started in the U.S. in the 1840s, way out in like New York, but um, there are only three states now in the U.S. that still have um, Sons of Herman, and guess what? Texas is one of them. It gives you an idea of how strong the German community was here. There was a lodge that was founded in um, 1891, July of 1891, here in Fort Worth, um, and they had, um, they had a park. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you'll see the arrow kind of shows you um, where the park was, and um, you will notice it says Herman Park Beer Garden. It's kind of sideways next to the star, but um, it was definitely known as a beer garden. And um, so uh, there were Mayfests that happened there, but um, there were also, um, much like the um, Greenwald Pavilion, um, you could rent it out. And uh, unfortunately, the Sons of Herman they had some financial difficulty and they, um, they nearly lost the property. And so guess who steps in? It is Zane Seti and the Texas Brewing Company that buys the property so it can continue to operate. And you might think, well, um, Zane Seti doesn't sound like a very German name at all. Um, so, oh, the other thing before I move on, um, I wanted to note, so the city of Fort Worth actually had a, an ordinance that prevented, um, starting in the 1880s, um, there was no drinking in the city in, on Sundays. And um, so you're wondering, well, wait a minute, there was um, way off on Samuels Avenue, which is like, what, mile and a half from the courthouse? There's, you know, a beer garden there. And then here, like, 
what is that, half a mile from the courthouse? There's another beer garden. How did the city, like, why didn't they, you know, put the, bring the hammer down on these guys and stop these Germans from, you know, having their beer gardens? And by the way, it wasn't just Germans. It was like pretty much everybody in town who felt like going on a Sunday and relaxing. Um, so that was considered, those two areas were considered the north side of the city. They were outside the boundary of the city of Fort Worth. So these guys weren't dumb. They built their, um, their little um, party and beer pavilions um, outside, so that, outside the city limits so that they could continue to operate their business as they pleased. Um, the people in Hell's Half Acre um, struggled with um, the ordinance and tried to fight against it. Um, so back to Zane Seti. Um, here's an actual, it's the only, it's hard to believe, you know, here's like one of the major founders of Fort Worth and there's only like, as far as I know, one photo and this is him. Um, so um, Zane Seti was as near German as an American could be and not be German. He was actually um, English, American. Um, he was born to a Quaker family. His father was, um, American, born in Philadelphia. I don't know where um, his father was from, but his mother was off the boat English. Um, but he goes to Germany at the age of 15 in 1859 to study and um, to study in Germany. Um, and he, he lives in the Rhine area, along the Rhine, and he doesn't return to the US until 1870. So he spends a chunk of his youth. Surely he spoke German. I mean, you can't not speak German and have lived there for, um, you know, more than a decade. Um, he ends up marrying a German woman, Emma Amalia Hoflein, um, in 1874, who, um, unsurprisingly, also came from the same area where he had been living. Um, so undoubtedly, he met her there. Um, so yeah, Zane Seti was um, intimately familiar with the German lifestyle, and would have been. Um, would have been felt very connected to the Sons of Hermann. Uh, Sons of Hermann, they didn't um, allow, when they had their meetings, it wasn't until 1937 that they stopped holding their um, meetings in German. So, um, so yeah, they um, definitely tried to cling on to that German culture. Um, so Germans were not always super collegial. Um, especially when it came to their beer business, um, you know, was fighting the schooners, the title of this article. So in July of 1883, local liquor dealers, mostly um, beer, as noted by the article, um, they met to discuss um, what was to be done about the city ordinance on not serving on Sundays, but it kind of devolved into a discussion about market share and the price of beer. Um, so Lemps, this is before, this is 1883, so um, all the beer in Fort Worth is being imported into um, Fort Worth. Um, and because the um, Texas Brewing Company doesn't get established until 1891, um, well, it doesn't open until May of 1891. So it's Lemps and um, Anheuser-Busch, and, or Anheuser, it's not Bush at that point yet. Um, so those are the two beers, and you basically signed a contract and you served one, typically served one beer or the other. The Tivoli, I noticed they served both beers. Um, and so Lemps had built an ice vault um, shortly before these guys met. And so the quality of their beer, um, it, it, maintained, it maintained the quality of the beer for longer. And so suddenly everyone wanted Lemps beer because it came from, you know, it was being kept in an, um, an ice house, and so no one wanted Anheuser. And, and in fact, the article just refers to it as the other beer. And so things got ugly and personal um, because some of the schooners, they started selling um, schooners for just five cents each to try and get, um, try and get customers. And um, it got very colorful. My favorite is the one where this one gentleman, he says, any man who would sell a schooner of beer for five cents would desert his country in her hour of need, that he was too mean to clean his nose on a white handkerchief, and that his sister would make dirty butter, and that finally he was a wart on the face of the body politic. You know. So 
a man not worthy to be known as a man. And I love that somehow, you know, his sister would be making dirty butter. But um, so, yeah, people felt um, very personal about this idea of stealing customers with these um, five cent schooners. And um, so they never resolved the issue of the um, serving on Sundays, and then they decided that they were going to have to establish a committee to figure out whether it was okay for people to sell five-cent schooners. But this one gentleman said he favored personal liberty and thought that if a man wanted to sell a schooner for five cents, he had a perfect right to do so, and no person had a right to interfere with him. So don't mess with your business. And so, yeah, there were a lot of threats thrown around. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, once um, the Texas Brewing Company takes over, then um, that really sort of pushes the other beers into the corner. Um, so, the legacy, what did all these, you know, Irish and these Germans, what did they leave for us and how did it change the world that we live in now? Um, so we have a Fort Worth Ale Trail, and yes, I know I'm skipping over Prohibition, you know, it was an ugly time, let's not think about that. Um, so, and that maybe is for, you know, another time, um, you know, that's politics and, and beer. But, um, so after Prohibition, the, um, everyone was happy, but, um, essentially breweries, particularly craft breweries, they have really been fighting to, um, uh, sort of claw back some of the privileges and rights that they had before prohibition came along. Um, so it's been an uphill battle, um, but thankfully we have a lot of breweries um, here in town. And um, thankfully now the city no longer has a no drinking on Sunday. And, um, you know, they openly, it's, it's a tourism industry, so it's a big deal now. And so now instead of, you know, the Chisholm Trail and Cowboys coming through, we now have drinkers on the Fort Worth Ale Trail. Um, isn't that so much better? Um, we have a lot of variety, um, and that's what, you know, the, the Irish and the English, they brought their porters and their ales, but the Germans, when they arrive, they bring this variety of beer that we still enjoy now. So, you know, if you want to drink your ale, if you want to drink your Guinness, drink your Guinness. If you want you know, an IPA or a Goza or any of those things, those are, you know, or a Bach, um, those are all available. Um, so, you know, this, these immigrants really brought, um, they really changed the sort of flavor landscape of the world for us. Um, we have beer gardens again, um, isn't that lovely? And so, and these are not the only ones. I, by the way, I just, whatever I squeezed in, whatever pretty pictures, so I'm not preferring one brewery over another. I encourage you to all go on the beer trail or the ale trail. Um, so brewery tours are still a thing also. Um, you can notice I have the Texas Brewing Company. I guess they were too popular. They had to restrict the hours that people would come through their brewery. And unsurprisingly, you know, breweries are a business. They got to make their beers for people to enjoy. So they try to keep the hours of the tours to a specific time. And so um, there are still events held at breweries. And so, you know, there's trivia, there's music. Um, there's also fundraisers, just like um, back in the day, um, Grunewald and his pavilion, um, the Baptist ladies had a fundraiser. Um, and then, you know, the, um, there's also fundraisers for um, the cemetery to put up a fence, you know, that was all in the 1890s. Um, so now they're, you know, breweries host fundraisers um, by other people. Um, there's also music. Um, and we still have a Mayfest. And we, um, it's probably not so much centered around a May Queen anymore. It's, you know, as things change with the times, you know, the Mayfest has changed a little bit. Um, there's no longer voting for a May Queen. And um, probably not a Maypole anymore, but um, that sort of vestigial legacy of having a Mayfest and enjoying um, what the spring brings to us. So, and um, Texas Craft Beer, you know, they have to, they lost, as I said, they lost a lot of 
there's sort of privileges as a result of you know, prohibition and prohibitionists. And so um, they have to advocate for, you know, they have a craft pack. Um, they have to advocate for their rights. And some of them have been pretty recent, um, pretty recent changes. So they've been active. Um, and I didn't cover it, but um, back in the day, the breweries, in some cases, they were illegally politically active, but hopefully the Texas <laughs> craft pack is not operating illegally. Um, the end. Any questions? Oh, all right. So, um, I work out at Thurber, where there used to be coal mines and brick factories, and we, uh, we had at one point 15,000 uh, immigrants that basically worked in the company town, and one of the beers that was the most popular there came from the Texas Brewing Company. records of the Texas Brewing Company shipping out to different destinations on the different railroad tracks uh, because TMP went straight through Thurber, right? So that would have been an easy, I mean, to just go and drop it off and collect the money and go, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they were definitely, they were actually even shipping, they had plans to ship even out of state. Um, I mean, not super far, you know, they weren't going up to the Northeast. I mean, they knew that their their sort of sales boundary was um, around Texas and then um, up to like Oklahoma. But I didn't see any specific records because they're, um, I could not find, the company records don't exist sadly because those would have been super entertaining because I really want to know why James Gannon left so suddenly. Um, but, but yeah, they were, they were definitely, you know, they had those refrigerator cars and so they were, they were shipping out. Um, other, other questions? Where was the next group? Um, so close to where the, um, so they were on Jones and Ninth. So close to where the, the bus station is, the TNP, you know, the multimodal center down there. Uh, you mentioned Louis Pasteur and his demonstration of fermentation. Did the Egyptians know that the yeast in the water, or did they just naturally ferment? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeast is like literally just, you know, it's. Did they add more yeast to it? Yeah, probably. Um, I, to be honest, I didn't like dig into it. I mean, I personally, I brew kombucha, and, you know, like, you know, you just take a little bit of, you know, the liquor from the previous brew, and then you start brewing the next batch. So um, they were probably just doing it that way. And, um, the interconnection between bread making and brewing is really strong. And it's still like that. I mean, I, mean, I know some breweries, they, they give their spent grain to um, bakeries, and then other breweries give their spent grain to um, like animal feed operations, which is great, because you know, then they're not wasting um, you know, valuable food stock. Someone over here, someone over here had a question. Another question. Um, the the Texas Brewing Company. You said there aren't many company records left. But would, would there been, or do you, do you know, would there have been indication? Would they have done their own malting? Would they've gotten barley locally from the local farmers? They definitely. The reason the um, building was so big, it, it was they did it all inside. And if you look really carefully at the historic photos, um, you'll actually see on the side of the building it says. Um, there's like all the little operations. And then in one of the articles, it, I think I clipped out most of it, but they describe the tour through every single part. And that's actually one of the reasons why they had to expand. Um, they were um, not just malting, and, um, but they, they had to expand to um, build more um, barrels. They, they had a cooperage. Um, so they, it was basically entirely vertically integrated. They, they ran the whole show themselves. The photographs and everything, were they in that book you showed at the beginning? Um, some of the photos are in the Hightower and Brown book. Um, but yeah, that's a great book. I really, I really enjoyed it. And then Mike Nichols, of course, covers some of the other, you know, because he takes individual topics and really digs into them. Um, 
And um, you'll find some of the photos on Mike Nichols' blog too. Um, and then we also have, I think some of them are available on the, um, well, there's only, I think, like a couple of photos that show the, um, the brewing company building. Um, there aren't very many of them. Surprisingly, there are not very many like early Fort Worth um, photographs. Well, and there are some photographs at the North Fort Worth Historical Society. There's also some photographs at the, in the archives of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, we do have a question on the Zoom. What was the impact of prohibition on the breweries in Fort Worth? Um, well, I mean, they all tried to convert to other, like, you know, they made non-alcoholic products, um, but it, it killed the Texas Brewing Company. They, they struggled for a while, and then it was purchased um, by a different company. Um, oh, do I have to hit answer live? It just... Okay, but anyways, it, it killed a lot of the breweries, and it, you know, um, people really struggled, and they made, I think one of the, the products was Grano. It was basically like beer. It was like near beer, I guess, and people weren't having it. I mean, people who were really wealthy, they stocked up because they knew, pro although mainly they stocked up on hard liquors because, you know, beer just doesn't, isn't going to last that long. But because um, the prohibition prevented the sale of beer, um, but it didn't prevent home production or drinking. So if you had a huge stockpile, like I think actually Eamon Carter had, he had a party house on Lake Worth and he had a huge, he was known to have a huge stockpile of liquor. Um, so that man did not suffer at all as a result of prohibition. He continued, the party went on at Eamon Carter's house. Um, so. We have one more question here. Uh, the, the beer garden. Um, that were there in the early um, 1900s, you said that they were formerly outside the city limits. Uh -huh. The current sites, are they still outside city limits or are they somewhere within? within you mean the ones that, like Herman Park and um, Grunewald Pavilion or? What, where they used to be. Oh, no, 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 that's all like inside. Like I think by 1920, um, the city had annexed. The city went through like periods of annexation um, and so, but yeah, so those areas, you know, like across, across the river, that's now part of the city. And um, but yeah, in like 1920s and then 1940, there were like huge periods of annexation where big chunks, and some people wanted to be annexed and some people didn't. I think the north side, if I remember correctly, they were not keen on annexation, like the far north, because um, they had, they were much wealthier than um, the city of Fort Worth um, because of the, I, I always think it's kind of funny that um, the, the breweries came about the same time as the um, slaughterhouse, like the meatpacking plants. And so, you know, this, this sort of, well, you can't have barbecue without beer. And so these two things happen at the same time. And um, so, I mean, it's not that people weren't barbecuing before the meatpacking plants, but I just always think of it as this sort of conjoining of these two perfect events and so. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today. And uh, let me remind you that if you were unable to attend one of our previous events, that you can find YouTube videos on the library's website. You can also find them on the Center for Texas Studies website, www.texasstudies.org or org, whichever you choose. Um, and if you like our Facebook page, we're always making announcements about that. And we also have an Instagram account. We're making announcements about all these things that are coming up for the future. So please reach out and we'll be happy to inform you. Now, next month on January 8th, we have a presentation entitled Texas Rangers, Ranchers and Realtors. James Hughes Callan, Callahan and the Day family in the Guadalupe River Basin. And that's going to be offered by Dr. Tom McDonald, who has his PhD in, of all things, cell biology, and who's been a career working at Alcon Laboratories, but this is his family, and he was very interested in 
kind of articulating what his family did. And so please join us for that event. And thank you so much for being here today. Nice job. Thank you. Nice thank job. you.